I think I'm with the with the pragmatists that in fact uh, Darwin himself. I think that these are things which showed them that worked in the in the struggle for existence. That somebody who came and saw a bear, two bears go in, and one came out and says, "Oh, let's get out of the rain." is not going to survive and reproduce. Somebody who sees two bears go in and one come out and says, let's move on. I'm not that I'm not that cold and hungry. It's probably it's probably your great great granddad. Michael, it's great to see you. I have to tell you, I had a wonderful experience reading your new book, the manuscript, The Philosopher Looks at Human Beings from Cambridge University Press. Uh, it was uh, just a delight to read. Uh, I argued with you at, at times during the book and we'll get into that. Uh, but what it was, was it, it was a, uh, a release of a frustration that I've had because as you know, which our audience uh, will find out, that Closer to Truth has a major a new initiative in philosophy of biology of which you are one of the founders. And we're very proud that you are our senior advisor in the series, but of course, because of the COVID pandemic, we've been postponed for over a year now, but we look forward to it. We're frustrated we can't get at it. We have so much great material, but your book really delves into a critical area of in terms of evolution and why do we think we as human beings are superior to all other animals and are we right to do so? So very much look forward to, uh, to, to our conversation and to the publishing of the book. Well, thank you very much, Robert. As you can probably tell from the title a philosopher looks at, it's part of a series. A, a philosopher looks at sport, a look, philosopher looks at architecture. And I ended, I really wanted to do a philosopher looks at the Victorians because I wanted <laughs> to talk about the queen, but <laughs> Queen Victoria. But anyhow, I got this one. And you know, the funny thing is, as I got into it, I realized that this was the book I wanted to write. And it wasn't just a commission book. It was, I won't say the apotheosis of everything I've done, but it did feel very good. I've, I've just turned 80. I've, I've, I'd like to think I'm not quite at the end of my life, but it was a really nice feeling after 55 years as a professional philosopher to be able to write this book. And it, it, it reads that way. Uh, you, you really have the, the full uh, 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 closure and coming to being of, 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 a, of a very specific worldview. I was fascinated by you take a, you're very balanced and giving each side of the positions, but you, you put yourself right out there and come out with your particular orientation about human beings and our relationship to evolution. So I, I really want to get into it in detail. And the way to start is really what pervades the book is what you call a root metaphor between the world as an organism or the world as a machine. And obviously human beings the same, human beings as an organism and human beings as a machine. So take me through that. Well, okay. First of all, as I said, I turned 80, which meant that I was starting into philosophy in the 1960s, when particularly in the philosophy of science, the big book was Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And we all put our boot into Kuhn because we're philosophers. We don't like anybody in, encroaching on our area. But I have to say his fundamental notion of a paradigm, the idea of some kind of worldview like that has stuck with me. And I've, of course, I've then discovered, I mean, Kuhn himself likened it to metaphor. So I dug a bit into metaphor. And I realized I, I don't want to take anything from Kuhn's originality, but he didn't come from nowhere. He came from the whole linguistic thinking about metaphors and particularly what Stephen Pepper called root metaphors, the idea that there's fundamental ways of looking at things and particularly fundamental ways of looking at the world. And so that was the kind of philosophical, as it were, tie in. But then because of Kuhn, I got turned to the history of science because Kuhn said, if you want to do good philosophy of science, you've got to do good history of science. And I took that very seriously the extent of spending my first sabbatical in the early 70s in Cambridge working nonstop on the Darwin archives and that sort of thing. Oh. But so I got into the, I got, obviously got into the history of science and it, it didn't take long to discover the scientific revolution wasn't just a question of putting the sun at the center and the earth going round it, but it was much more fundamentally a sort of a, a re sort of reimagining of the way that we think. And of course, Kuhn, would have tied into this because he wrote the book on the Copernican revolution. 
And it, it, I mean, it's not original with me. I don't think it would be original with Kuhn that the, the scientific revolution wasn't just, as it were, the heliocentric theory. It was a different way of looking at things. Up to this point, starting with the Greeks and very comfortably working up through the great Christian philosophers like Augustine, Anselm, and particularly Aquinas, the, as it were, the root metaphor was the world as an organism. I mean, obviously, the Christians wanted to say that God had created it. Uh, Plato wanted to say it was the demiurge we did it. I, I think Aristotle wanted to say it's a fundamental part of our being in some sort of way. But that wasn't the point. They wanted to see the world as an organism, as a growth. And obviously, therefore, what is a sort of acorn to oak? What, what is the oak? Well, human beings, obviously, particularly both, both for the Greeks and for the uh, and for the uh, Cath well, the great Christian theologians. And the scientific revolution was a change. By this time, people were starting to use machines. The most obvious one was the clock. And that thing, but not just that. I mean, you know, when you're doing, uh, when you're, when you're doing um, windmills, uh, water supply, all of these things, people were increasingly building machines to help them to do things. And it wasn't long before, as it were, the root metaphor, alternative root metaphor to the, to the organic metaphor was the idea of the world as a machine or what we might say mechanism. And I, the, the, the philosopher who is best on this is the, is the chemist, Robert Boyle, of, you know, pressure, pressure times volume chap. And he is, he is very good on this. He says, we, we've got, to, we think now of the world as a clock as a machine where you've got these laws and it just keeps going on and on and on. Now, the interesting question is, well, what about God? Now, the, the world as a machine was not, as it were, as the new atheists might say, oh, well, this, this means that God is out. In fact, God was anything but out because Descartes bought right into the world as a machine. He wanted to talk about the body and the heart and all of these sorts of things. And Descartes was a good Catholic and Robert Boyle was a very sincere Protestant. On the other hand, as a great, a, a great Deutsche House uh, said about the scientific revolution, increasingly, God became a retired engineer. In <laughs> other words, God had made it all, set it going, but then God set back at, sat back and let it happen. Doesn't mean to say that there weren't miracles, but they weren't miracles of the kind of shoo, shoo, shoo. rather, it was the meaning that things evolved and came through. I mean, take something fairly non-controversial like the marriage of Cana, where supposedly Jean, Jesus turned the water into wine. Now, the old way would be to say God or Jesus said, boom, just like a magician and David Copperfield, and it changed. The new way would say, of course it was miraculous, but it's the meaning. Obviously what Jesus did was fill the host with guilt that he went down to the cellar and brought the good wine up that he was hiding. <laughs> and, but but it, it, that's still a miracle, but it's, <laughs> it's not a miracle of violation of laws. It's much more a miracle of meaning. So as I say, as you get into the 16th and 17th and into the 18th century, the time of the enlightenment, we've got the world as a machine. We've still got God, but increasingly he's being pushed more and more, not to the side, but to the beginning, if you like. So what you, started things off. So, so what, you're, what you're doing is you're saying when the world is an organism, it, it, it sort of has an intrinsic or natural value, whereas mm -hmm. if it's a machine and you want value, uh, uh, you have to somehow bring value into it. And so that's a fundamental distinction. Mm -hmm. I, I, think that, I think that's a good way to put it. But of course, People have always wanted to get more out of it than you put in. And there's no question that uh, up to, certainly, certainly up to uh, uh, Darwin, I think people, particularly when they looked at organisms, certainly Descartes, for instance, wanted to have it both ways. They wanted to say, yes, the world is a machine, but this doesn't mean we can't have value, particularly in the increase of things. And obviously humans are more valuable than others. And I think the person who put it, finger on the sort of, what should we say, the, the irresolvable uh, paradox was Kant. Kant worried himself silly about this. Kant, on the one hand, Kant wanted the world to be a machine. 
on the other hand, Kant was too damned honest to say, <laughs> OK, but that means we've got value. And Kant, in the third critique, I mean, he didn't come to an answer. And then, of course, along comes Darwin, who I think shows us how to incorporate human beings within the machine paradigm, if you like, within the machine world picture and a uh, world picture metaphor, as it were, where Darwin says, no, you don't need a design. I mean, you might have a designer God, but you don't need a designer God. It's all done through unbroken laws. And that's how we get the hand and the eye and that sort of thing. And mm. I think that this was this at this point was crunch time. And I think what happened is certainly well, I know what happened was a number of people, particularly in Germany, the so-called romantics, people like Goethe and Schelling and uh, others like that, said, no, there's too much tension here. We obviously, humans are superior. There's, you know, that, that's a given. Anybody who thinks, as I say in my book, anybody who thinks that humans are at the same level as warthogs, <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> they're not being serious. I mean, you might, as I do, rather like warthogs. But they're not they're not equal to humans. I mean, they, they're equal to my late headmaster, but that's a different that's a personal thing. <laughs> but anyhow, what so what I wanted what I wanted to say is no. So obviously the world is a machine, as you just pointed out, can have ultimately have no value. Clearly, humans are of greater value than anything else. So, ergo, the world is a machine isn't adequate. So what's the alternative? Go back to the world as an organism. Maybe we kicked it out too quickly. And so my book is very much a question of here we are today and we've got these tensions because the world as an organism had a, a, a long life after this, not only Spencer, but we've got people like Henri Bergson and I think most famously is, is A.N. Whitehead. Uh, Whitehead is quite clear that he He's an organicist. He, he goes back to the philosopher, the contemporary of Goethe, of philosopher Schelling, who was all important in this. And so what you've got then, on the one hand, is you've got the organicists like Whitehead and in the uh, uh, and there were scientists. I, I think Sewell Wright uh, was certainly influenced by these sorts of things and these sorts of ideas. And then on the other hand, you've got the world as a machine types which are most scientists and the people I want to pick out are Watson and Crick, a, a less ethereal pair of human beings it's impossible to meet. <laughs> I mean, what is the double helix? The double helix is a machine for replication and for getting organisms you know, or, organized and working. And of course the analogy I want to draw is with the Enigma, uh, Enigma machine, which at the beginning of the second world war was used by the Germans to transmit codes that we couldn't follow. But fortunately, the Poles and the Brits were able to break it down. But how did they do it? By treating the machine as a machine, taking it to bits and putting it together again. And that, of course, is exactly what Watson and Crick did. They took it all to bits. They looked at the individual molecules and then they said, put it back together, see how it works. There's no question that treating the, the world as a mechanism as opposed to an organism has enabled the scientific revolution. Uh, a reductionist approach works because you get down to DNA and certainly in, in particle physics, this is, this is the core, this is the core of, of, of the scientific method. The question though today is as we look to the totality of what human beings are, uh, and, and whether it's consciousness or our position in the world, is that sufficient? We needed to go through that phase, but is there some residue in an or organistic approach to the world? And so you staked your position as a mechanist, which I appreciate, and you did it very well, but I'm gonna try to defend the or or organicist position so you and I can have a dialogue. Hey, I have to interrupt and tell you one thing. Um, Thomas Kuhn, it, I'm not, is no, spelled exactly the same, is not related, but when <laughs> I was at, but when I was at MIT, I, uh, in the business school and, and in the, the brain science department as a, as a research associate uh, in 1980, I audited his course. And afterwards I went up to him and I said, where are your grandparents from? And it turns out we both had a grandmother from Romania. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe going back several generations, we are we are related, but uh, not that we we, we knew of. Okay, so uh, you you define the difference 
as the machine metaphor, you, you say, and this is your view, strips out the value as an intrinsic value, whereas the organist metaphor, the value is impregnated. It, it's, it's part of the, the way it works. Um, and so your task, if you want to bring value back, and that's an open question, because you feel that you should, it's not clear to me, and I think that's one of the deficits of the mechanist position, that you have to, you, you, you feel a need to put value in, and therefore you try to find it. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the first thing you have to think about is that these metaphors, and I think the other Kuhn, <laughs> the other Kuhn uh, made this point very clearly. These metaphors are not, these paradigms are not absolutely God-given the only way. I think that what, I mean, in, in a way, Kuhn's position is very Kantian, namely that what we're doing is imposing on the world a way to conceptualize it, if you like. I mean, we, we've got all these objects there. Now, how do you make sense of them? Do you put them all, as it were, into an organic picture? Or do you put them all into a machine picture? So my position would be ultimately there's no ultimate way. So what what is going to be? And so what does this mean? Well, yes, you're right. It means that under the organic metaphor, you're going to get humans as a value straight out of it. Now, understand, I am not denying humans are. I'm quite happy to say humans are of higher value than other animals. As I say, my late hate master accepted, and he had exactly the same position on me. But anyhow, so if you can hear the Oedipal issues coming out here, can't you? But anyhow, uh, so I want to say, yes, the world, the, the world is a machine. Why do, I want to, why do I want to insist on this? Well, ultimately, I guess I'm a pragmatist. My question is, which way is the better way to do science? And all I can say is in the 1930s and 40s, you organicists were sitting around having late night ball sessions all about the meaning of things and how things, organicism, and there were people like Waddington, as I say, Whitehead and the Neo-Whiteheadians and all of these people. And you were having great, you know, great evening sessions until two in the morning and that sort of thing. Meanwhile, you've got the, as I say, the most least ethereal human beings in the world, possibly Watson and Crick, whose only thoughts were on pints in the pub and, uh, you know, and, uh, and that's and girls. And yet they were making the biggest breakthrough in the history. Uh, sorry, I, I hit I, it's the phone at the back. Uh, we, they were making the biggest breakthrough in the history of science or the break, yeah. something no, nobody breakthrough. denies that nobody denies that that the, the reductionist approach the mechanist approach is uh, has has energized and enabled science the question ultimately is well maybe two questions one is can it take you all the way is that all there is and if that's the case can what is the motivation for you then re-injecting value it sounds right. like you, good, you, good what, question. What's, you, what's your motivation for that? Right. Well, that's two questions, Robert. Let's right. take them one by one. I think because, and I, again, I'm not being original here. Kuhn, the other Kuhn says this. People like Mary Hesse, who worked on metaphor, say this. The, the whole point about a root metaphor, a way of looking at things, is you're going to conceptualize what you're looking at. But you recognize there are going to be some questions as it were, you don't ask, aren't within the domain of what you're doing. As it were, they're, they're, you're not even, I mean, Kuhn the, makes this point very clearly. He says, the whole good thing about paradigms is it focuses you. you yes. It's like having blinkers on if you're in the derby or something like that. It means you don't spend your time. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna work on, that, what should we say? If you're gonna work on the double helix, you don't need to be worrying yourself about whether or not Leonardo was homosexual, for instance. I mean, it's a per no, it's a perfectly genuine question, and I could see reasons why somebody might want to say, "Oh yes, 
if somebody's gay, they're going to portray, let's say, men and women in this sort of way. I'm not saying this is true, but I, I think it's a perfectly meaningful question to ask. Or if they're heterosexual, they're going to do it. They're perfectly good questions. But if you're working on the double helix, it's <laughs> not much help to be looking at this. So my position very much would be that if you're going to use the machine metaphor, there's some questions that you're simply not even going to address. Like, why is there something rather than nothing? I mean, the machine metaphor is very much like that cookbook. First, take your hair and, and then get going. I mean, so in other words, the machine metaphor, oh, yeah, you got the Big Bang. But what? Yes, that's maybe started it in a temporal way. But why the hell do we have anything at all? What Heidegger called the fundamental question of metaphysics. Why is there something rather than nothing? And I don't think the machine metaphor even it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't answer it. It doesn't even set out to answer it. Just That's like right. so. So on the one hand, I think you've got that sort of thing. And so I would want to say when it comes to values, the machine metaphor doesn't even set out to answer why mm. are humans superior. It can give you, the machine metaphor can give you all sorts of information about humans about, for instance, why we might be able to get through the maze much more quickly than white rats or something like that. I mean, that's fine. But it doesn't then say, ah, oh, but it's superior to be able to do this. I have to say that that question, why is there something rather than nothing, is also the, one of the fundamental questions of Closer to Truth. And we try to address it in all different ways. You're saying the, the, me the mechanistic uh, model does not address that. But why then do you insist on finding value? You're bringing the, the a, a need, a psychological need that you have to have value, and you need to now bring it into your mechanistic model. Well, it, it, isn't that I, I, a kind no, of contradiction? I'm not exactly bringing it into my mechanistic model. First of all, you use the word psychological need, and of course, I'm a philosopher. I think anything to do with the social sciences must mean you're downgrading it. Uh, so, I, 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 yeah, it's a psychological need, but I don't feel it's a, a kind of a second-rate need. I think it's a philosophical need, okay. which means it's absolutely an A-plus need. No, it, it, seriously, I'm a human being. That's what it's all about. And uh, so, as far as I'm concerned, uh, asking questions like, why, are, why do I have this conviction? that we are superior to other animals or to, to plants as well. I mean, not in every respect, obviously. I don't think, for instance, I mean, I think the devotion a dog can show is you know, can equal anything that humans can show. So I'm not pretending that, as it were, we uniquely have all the plus things and no one else has them. I'm not saying that, but I do think overall we're superior. So my point is this, I want to say, obviously then, my values do not come from the machine model, but mm -hmm. I don't think they have to contradict the machine model. I like to say they supplement it in some sort of way. And I want to say that values come from us. And this is why in my book of all things, I say that I'm an existentialist in the sense that I don't think, I, you know, we're condemned to freedom. Here we are. And we have to make the values, and these are our values, uh, and that, that's just fine. I, I, obviously, my value system puts humans above. If anybody wants to disagree, well, they can disagree. Okay, but so then as a mechanist, you're saying that your, your position is as a mechanist, but you feel this philosophical need, not a social science need, but a philosophical need to then bring value in uh, so that your worldview is not limited to mechanism. Mechanism does not exhaust reality. There is residue that you have to explain. Is that right? That's a good, that's a good point, Robert. But let me just pull back one thing because you brought something up about why is there something rather than nothing? I'm very much, uh, I'm not an atheist. I, I call myself an agnostic, but I, I mean, by my, my wife's an agnostic, which means she doesn't care. <laughs> I, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, yeah. a lot of people just, Passionate, passionate agnosticism, that's right. I... But I, I obviously I'm very passionate about this, but I take my guide from the um, from the geneticist JBS Haldane, who said, not only is the world queerer than I think it is, it's queerer than I could think it is. Yeah, that's and that's wonderful. where I that's now that's not a philosophy of despair. It's certainly not a philosophy of giving up 
or anything like that. It's recognition that I'm going to cap I'm going to try to capture different aspects of my experience, obviously aspects of my experience that are important to me, and I'm going to try to, to work with them. So, for instance, I don't think the machine metaphor answers the body-mind question. I don't think it even asks that. I think right. Leibniz showed us that in the monadology, that if you believe that the, you know humans are machines and that sort of thing, there ain't no mind, at least not in that way. Well, what, what, you, what you're now doing is reconfirming your iconoclastic uh, uh, image because most mechanists believe that the mind-body problem will be solved under mechanism without additional. So, yes, well, I mean, I don't mean I don't have any inclinations about the mind-body problem. I mean, I, as I say, I go back to evolutionists in, in the 19th century, particularly W. Clay Clifford, uh, who said, since everything just evolved, I think we have to assume some kind of monism, a kind of spinozistic monism, or even panpsychic monism. And I, <laughs> I, I think I'm, like a lot of philosophers, I think these days, I'm very much drawn to that. So when people say, oh, well, you're just a materialist, I say, well, yes, but my materialism is monistic <laughs> materialism. It's, I don't think that it's just, uh, how do molecules think? I mean, how do they think? Unless it's there at some level before it starts, I just don't think you can get off the ground. So certainly I'm not, as it were, a, you know, putting the problem of the body-mind problem on one side. What I'm saying is I think some kind of assumption of monism is made for philosophical grounds. I don't think it's part, I don't think I'm a mechanist because I'm a monist. I think what I'm saying is I'm a monist, which I think can help make some sense of my, my mechanism, but I don't pretend, I certainly don't think me mechanism is going to solve the body-mind problem. I don't think it can. So okay. I, well, as far as yeah, that most, is concerned. Most scientists and many philosophers right, but, feel it I, can. Whether there's gonna be, I, we, we can ever take the question any further beyond that. Well, perhaps we can. I mean, think people have discovered things that, you know, a hundred years ago, they said you could never find them out. So I don't want to say that, but I think there'll always be, you know, that little bit in the bottom that you can't get out. And, uh, you and, talk you know, about... Robert, Robert, that's what makes life so bloody <laughs> exciting. Isn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be awful if we had every truth laid out by the time we were 10? And we, I mean, as some people think they do have, you know, the Billy Grahams of the world. God. <laughs> What a sterile way of behaving. Oh, yes, I've got to do this because the big, you know, creator in the sky said, no, no, we're condemned to freedom. And that's the most exciting thing that can be. Yeah, well, well said. You talk about uh, three groups um, of, of human uh, uh, society to, to whom this root metaphor, organis, or, or, organicist versus mechanist is important. You talk about the religious the secular, and then you have this third term, creationist. Now, what you you don't mean is <coughs> people who believe <laughs> well, in that's a, creation. That's a, a private in joke because anybody who knows me knows that I've spent fifty years fighting creationists. Right. I mean, right. I was there with Steve Gould in Arkansas in 1981, right, defending right. you know, <laughs> defending right. evolution against right. the the creationists. So. Everybody knows that I'm not a big C creationist, but right. when I call myself a creationist, a small C creationist, what I mean is it's not given to me on high. It's not found, as it were, here. Sorry, move the computer around. So it's not like that. It's something that has to come from within at some sort of level, condemned to freedom. I mean, in a way, creationism isn't a terribly good thing because that almost means I could believe anything. I could believe it's okay to bash little old ladies on the head on Fridays. No, I'm not that kind of creationist. But what I want to say is my commitment to the belief that it's wrong to bash little old ladies on a Friday, you should wait until Saturday, is very much a something that, well, it, it's my decision. At some level, it's me. And it's I'm not doing it because God told me. I'm not doing it because you told me, and I'm certainly not doing it because my headmaster told me. <laughs> Let's talk about teleology, which um, has uh, a, a has had uh, a a bad name in in science because it it reflects back on uh, 
um, pre-Darwinian thinking that God created everything for a purpose, and that's how we look at things. Of course, Aristotle had the final cause, uh, but 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 you make an interesting point. You say that Darwin's theory is theological in a sense that the final cause is is impregnated within that. That's not an ordinary way to discuss it. Well, it's the right way, though. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't. I said I'm condemned to freedom. It didn't mean I'm condemned to modesty. <laughs> uh, no, I mean what I want to say is the kind of teleology, final cause thinking that I think worries certainly mechanists, and I'm a mechanist, the, the sort of thing which worries us is either the only way you can explain it is by the great designer in the sky. The only way you can get the eye, as I like to say, the only way you can get the eye is through the great optician in the sky. I mean, maybe he's back there, but it's not part of the explanation. Or the Aristotelian position, at some level, there's some kind of vital force, what, you, what Bergson called an alarm vital, which, as it were, in some sense, direct. I don't want anything to do with those, and Darwin didn't want anything to do with them. Doesn't mean to say you can't think in terms of ends, like what is the purpose of the nose in order to sit, smell, and that sort of thing. So, you know, not smell now, but, you know, perhaps later on, you know, a rose, you go out into the garden or something, and that's what you're doing it for. So I think you can think in those ways, but there's nothing. I'm not saying God did it. I'm not saying it's a vital cause did it. I'm saying it's just a product of natural selection. And I could be wrong because I want to say, for instance, a liking for sweet things is obviously a good thing. And it was a good thing in our past and natural selection did it. But as you and I well know, in America, a liking for sweet things you know, has backfired. The obesity in America is a bad thing. So that's my kind of teleology. It can go wrong. Whereas I don't think at some level the teleology of God can ever go wrong. I mean, you know, he's God after all. So <laughs> my, my, uh, obviously I want to say, yes, I, I, it's, it, I'm trying to solve Kant's problem here. Kant saw that we have to think teleologically, but it's a mechanist. So Kant wanted to say it's heuristic and it's something of a weakness. Yeah. I want to say, yes, it's heuristic, but it's not a weakness. It's because organisms are different from just rocks yeah. and mountains and that sort of thing. So we can explain it perfectly legitimate. And I think natural selection does it. So in other words, I see Darwin as answering Kant's worries in some sort of sense. Yeah. Uh, so so my, my position is one very firmly, if you like, in, I mean, I'm not saying anything which is, as it were, out of the, I'd like to say, even the mainstream of philosophy. I'm, I'm not a Mary Baker Eddy. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, well, that's a bit, well, okay, no, it's not me. I mean, in other words, what I'm saying is I'm not trying to invoke weirdo sorts of scenarios, you know, laser beams to cause uh, the fires in California and that sort of thing. I, I, I'm trying to work with Kant. I'm trying to work as you saw, on the body-mind problem, I'm working with Leibniz. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and obviously, I'm certainly with Aristotle in thinking that the world is, is organic looking. The question is, how do you deal with it? So um, some would take the position that because value is such an intrinsic uh, part of our uh, way of looking at the world, and, you, and you've already admitted that because even though you're a mechanist, you have to do something with what you intrinsically feel is value in, and deal with the mechanistic model. Some would then reverse that and say, because this value is so fundamental, whether it's morality or value in human beings, that I'm going to start with an organistic model, but that is the model, not the mechanistic model, but we have to therefore build into the organistic model a, uh, a, a reductionist component so we can do good science. I don't think any of the, the, the philosophers who, who uh, espouse this, uh, John Dupre, for example, who's also an advisor on our philosophy of biology project, um, his view is the organic or the organistic model mm -hmm. uh, because, of, because of value. Um, so are we having a kind of a, a dispute over, over nothing that everybody sort of- No, we're not having a dispute. It's certainly nothing. I think somebody who takes that position is philosophically schizophrenic. They are hunt, running with the hare and hunting with the hounds. I mean, <laughs> they're saying, oh, yes, I'm an organicist. Oh, oh, 
it won't work. No, I'm a mechanist. Well, okay, you can do this, but you know, it's like you know, it's like in personal relationships. Make up your bloody mind, fellow. <laughs> do you want to go with the blonde or the brunette? Does she want to go with you, or does she want to go with Robert Kuhn? Bad mistake, but it's her decision, not mine. So, <laughs> but I think I, you're doing the same thing. Uh, you're no, doing I'm the same not. thing. You're, you're taking not. mechanism I'm models not, and bringing I'm in value. In, you see, I think somebody who says, "I'm going to be an organicist." Oops, it won't work. I'm now going to be a mechanist. Uh, uh, Inconsistent. I am not in any sense denying mechanism all the way through. But if you remember, going back to what I said, I don't think it's Kuhn said, and as, as metaphor people say, the whole thing about metaphors is they don't even set out to answer everything. If I'm working on the double helix, I am not talking about whether being gay or straight makes any difference to your painting. Right, right, I think right. it's a perfect, I think it's a perfectly legitimate right. question to ask, sure. but it's not mine. And right. so what I'm saying is I look at the world mechanistically. I think as a mechanist, there are certain questions I cannot, I don't, I don't even set up. It's not that I ask and fail to answer. It's that I don't ask. And one of them is why is there something rather than, I don't even ask that question. Yeah. Well, well I, I ask it all the time and I'm going yes, to know you to do, ask it. But you don't ask it in the context of being a mechanist. That's the whole point. Of course, I'm not saying, you know, we, we use different metaphors, my friend. You know, on the one hand, I, you know, she's a, a red, red rose or whatever it is. And the other hand, you know, he's a stinker or he, dare I say he's a something hole. You know, I mean, we, we're always you. We use all sorts of metaphors. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's perfectly consistent to say, oh, he's a real beanstalk, really upstanding. But, you know, he's a bit of a some two metaphors at the same time. It's not inconsistent <laughs> it's when you want to make okay. them both right. the same. Let, 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 let's go. Let's go further to another group of, of very smart kinds of people who are not arguing between the metaphors, but are arguing for the uh, the Darwinian or neo-Darwinian thinking, is that sufficient to explain the reality that we find? And two examples that you have in the book and, and you deal with them, uh, I think, honestly, even though you disagree with them, are uh, Stephen Jay Gould's uh, Organisms as a Whole, Holism, uh, his, uh, the punctuated equilibrium model, which is a different model of evolution uh, that that focuses rather than on individual uh, characteristics, looks at organisms as a whole. I'm going to give you both. And the second uh, and, and uh, more uh, iconoclastic and more against the tradition is Thomas Nagel, who comes to the conclusion as an atheist, that's Thomas Nagel is a famous atheist, but he comes to the conclusion that there are natural teleological laws governing the development of organizational systems over time, in addition to the laws that we're familiar with, the laws of physics, and these govern the structure of the universe, the behavior of organisms, and ultimately, of course, his main thing, the mind-body problem. So those are two different approaches that both um, undermine uh, the Darwinian, neo-Darwinian, and, and your approach uh, to, uh, to evolution. Well, I think, Robert, I think these are two, I mean, I'm glad you brought them up because I think they're two different kind of attacks on Darwinism. Yes. As I see Steve Gould, basically what he's making is a scientific critique. He's saying there are fundamental aspects of the world, homologies, you know, the, the, the isomorphisms between organisms, <clears throat> which at some level are absolutely fundamental. And Darwinian natural selection, evolutionary theory, it may mention them, it just doesn't tackle them adequately. So I take that to be a scientific criticism. And although in that particular Spandrel's paper, Gould does not tie it in with punctuated equilibrium, it's obviously there in some sense at the back because mm. punctuated equilibrium is going to downplay adaptation as you switch from one form to another. And of course, what Gould is doing in the, in the Spandrel's paper is attacking adaptationism. So as I say, I see this at some level, a fairly fundamental uh, scientific attack. I, I'm not saying Gould didn't have, you know, philosophical issues, you know, motivating him. But I, I, I think Gould himself would say those articles are intended to be science. 
They're not in the proceedings of the National, not, not the National Academy, the Royal Society. They're not there because they're nice philosophy. They're there because they're serious science. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I, or, you know, I'm not, I mean, I don't want to hide behind others, but, but I'm not a professional evolutionist. I think that these people have adequately answered it. And starting with Darwin. Darwin fully acknowledges homologies, but what he says is, these come about through evolution, and evolution is driven by natural selection, and that's why we have homologies. So Darwin is not denying homologies at some level, but he is right. I mean, he's disagreeing with, with uh, Gould. He doesn't want to say these are the fundamental starting point. He wants to say these are, if you like, rather like Galileo's laws, which are tremendously important, but they're explained by Newton's laws. Doesn't mean to say Galileo's laws aren't important. It's just that they come after. And I think that's what Darwin wants to say about homologies. They're, they're Galileo's laws or they're Kepler's laws. Tremendously important, but they're explained by natural selection. Whereas I think Steve wants to say, or wanted to say, no, the homologies start up there. And then, as it were, we can explain things like punctuated equilibrium. Now, of course, one way you're going to start to decide this is to look at the fossil record or elsewhere and say, was there really, punct did we get those punctuated equilibria? Right. Now, we don't want to get into this argument now because we're not scientists, but the fact is a lot of Darwinians have gone after punk egg and said, you know, we don't need it. it, it it's a solution looking for a problem. Yes, so, right. I mean, but that, so anyhow, as I say, I think that's the way one could, and I would, you know, endorse going after that one. Now, Nagel, now I'm glad you brought Nagel up, because Nagel, of course, is, is I think, offering much more of a philosophical critique, right. uh, which is one, you know, which is okay, he's a philosopher, so I, I, I'm not going to knock that. But I think Nagel wants to say, at some level, I mean, it's almost like, why is there something rather than nothing? Nagel wants to say, there are aspects of the world, design-like aspects of the world, that no, I guess, no mechanistic position could possibly in principle explain and, and since darwinism is mechanistic darwinism not only can't explain it but at some level almost in principle can't explain it. of course now don't forget this got nagel tying himself in knots because nagel then became very pally or very enthusiastic about intelligent design theory which of course puts god you know doing it all and nagel says he's he's an atheist well i think i'm allowed as a philosopher to say Hang on a minute, mate. You are pushing or, you know, praising intelligent design theory, which starts with God. And then you turn around and tell me you're an atheist. Now, you know, that's just running with the hair and hunting with the hounds. I, I think to be fair to Tom. Um, I, that, Why that, be fair to Tom? It's not that, fair to anybody that, else. Go on, I'm sorry. It's a little facile because uh, it, it, intelligent design, which we can certainly critique, uh, deals not with God, but it deals with something that can't, you can't infer a God, a Christian God, or Zeus, or anything else. You can only infer that there's something that you need extra in the system. It doesn't have to be God. And and Tom would take the, uh, the complexity theory part of intelligent design, not the God part, and say, and, and agree with that, and then try to find an explanation for that, that has no relationship to God. Tom, what was his famous comment? It's not that he doesn't believe in God. He hopes the world has has no God because a world with God would be so bad. So yeah, Tom I'm goes- I'm inclined to agree with him on that, but- Tom goes beyond normal atheism, which doesn't believe in God. He doesn't want there to be a God. So, was, so, then, he, so then, he, then he goes to um, uh, teleology and, and, and takes that word and tries to build it into the system into this maybe monadic system that you're talking about for mind-body problem, maybe Tom is trying to get that complexity, that teleology, and build it into the nature of things. Not God, but teleology. Well, you know, I noticed you've done too much philosophy. I noticed you slipped in early that my position was facile. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 look, I don't blame you. I, I, well, I, I admire the way you just slip that into the ordinary conversation. Listen, folks, it's facile. I, now I'll make the girl go in. I, 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 only, I only do that. I only do that with my best friends. Well, Robert, please understand. 
that's crazy for me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the kind of philosopher who gets cheesed off when that happens. I, like, I wish I'd done it myself. But anyhow, so no, I think what I want to say, first of all, I want to be a little bit nasty. I don't think Nagel, Thomas Nagel, ever gives me evidence of having sat down and slogged through some of the serious works on evolutionary theory by Theodosius Dobshansky, for instance, or Ernst Mayer, or even Dick Lewenton. I mean, you know, before he became you know, a Marxist and all that sort of thing. I mean, Dick Lewenton was doing the most Darwinian reductionistic work is possible to do. But uh, I would think, I mean, he talks about the origin of life, for instance. Well, he doesn't seem to be aware of the huge amount of work which has been done on this. I'm not saying they've got the solution, but to say, oh, well, they just make the assumption, just, it's not really fair. And I would say the same about you know, natural selection. I'd like to see Nagel sit down, I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but I'd like to see Nagel sit down and give us an argument as to why, let's say, uh, some you know, serious work which has been done on guppies, for instance, like my, my colleague Joe Travis does, down in, where is it, Bermuda or not Bermuda, one, one of Barbados or something like that. I'd like to see Thomas Nagel sit down and tell me why these explanations of why, you know, some guppies give birth early, some guppies give birth late, and it's all done in, in terms of different predators and that sort of thing. I'd like to see Nagel tell me why that isn't good science and that is working. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'd like to see is okay, put up or shut up. What is you? I mean, the, the teleology, at least Aristotle had the unmoved mover. I mean, Aristotle's system, I don't think was right, but it made sense. Mm -hmm. It said, okay, when we're trying to look at things, everything is striving for excellence. And that means striving to get to or to be like the unmoved mover. He didn't think that we, any of us are gonna get there, but that was Aristotle's position. Now, I want to say to Nagel, don't just throw out Elan Vital or whatever it is, Vito or something like that. Give us a bit more information about this. Where do you see this is working? How do, I mean, can we measure it or any of these things? When he starts to do this, I'll take Thomas Nagel a hell of a lot more seriously than I do. And apart from the fact he calls us all materialists, as I said, I don't think, I think a lot of Darwinians are monists. So <laughs> if, I don't think we're materialists. Well, Nagel's, of course, uh, final frontier is, uh, is consciousness. This is what he, uh, he started with that and is the ultimate uh, uh, backstop for his, uh, uh, for his uh, anti-Darwinian approach. Um, yeah, but and, and here, here you, you actually agree, you both agree that there is no traditional God, and, 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 you, and you both agree that you need something more than a materialist position. And I think we're both, draw I mean, I've read Nagel, and he's a bit, you know, he's a bit hesitant, but it seems to me Nagel is closest to being a monist of any of the positions. I'm not saying he's an orthodox monist or anything like that, but he's certainly not, you know, he's certainly not a materialist. Like Dan Dennett, for instance. Sure. He's certainly not. What is it that's that kind of materialism? Uh, like Jack Smart. He's certainly not an emergentist in that sort of way. You know, put the molecules and that. I mean, so I I think if I mean my feeling is if he were com to commit himself, if St. Peter said, "Give me an answer, or you're not coming in," I suspect he you know he'd be a monist. Yeah. So, so I don't uh, think on this, you, you you agree whether it's panpsychism or, yeah. or or some sort of a, of of a of a mind independent reality that that's a significant. I mean, that's the ultimate test. Are you a materialist? Is that yes? But I'd question? like to see. I'd what I want to see now is Nagel, it, whether he's a monist or whatever he wants to call himself. I want to see how he's going to cash this out, and get those forces or something like that. I want to say, I think that, yeah, clearly that there's more to the world than just molecules because, you know, <laughs> you and I are thinking beings. That's all there is to it. And, and more than that, I think my dogs are thinking beings. And of course, they're not human beings. But to say that dogs, I mean, dogs can clearly 
feel guilt, for instance. Anybody who thinks that they haven't come into the house and you know the dog pooed somewhere. I mean, you know that. And, so, and the question is, is that is that guilt uh, just some combination of recurrent cir circuitry between the brain hemispheres and well, some, that's, some I mean, memories? But, uh, you know, but, can you, then, can you, you encode know, it when, all in that? Yeah, but when you come home having had a nice time with the secretary and your wife says to you, "Did you, was it a good conference, dear? <laughs> you know, you say, no, it's pretty boring. <laughs> okay, the guilt is just circuit, whatever it is. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll give you facile. I'll give you facile, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What we're going to do now, we don't have a lot of time left, but I have so many things I want to talk to. I'm, I'm just going to list a number of topics that you have in the book. Uh, a, a Philosopher Looks at Human Beings, a fantastic book, Michael, in all seriousness. I recommend it to everyone to, to get it. It's a great read. It's an, it's an easy read for some hard, hard um, uh, uh, and, and very profound ideas. Uh, so recommend it to everybody to go out and buy it. Um, but you have a lot of a lot of uh, um, ideas in the book that we, we're not going to get in detail. So I, I'm going to list them, and I want one or two sentences about each one. Um, and uh, I'm just going to these going to be random random thoughts. So get ready. First one is you talk about panentheism, which is a a philosophical system where there is a god that. It, it, that is like pantheism, where God is just the reality, but God is beyond that, that God is embedded in reality, but beyond that. And, and you were less critical than I thought you might have. Well, I, I mean, obviously, if I'm a monist or panpsychic monist, then I'm a lot closer to a panentheist than Dan Dennett would be. I mean, well, now that's not, you know, <laughs> that's not to put Dennett down. Happy to do so. And that's not a high, high that's not a high hurdle. other grounds to do that. <laughs> no, but um, no, but so as I say, at some level, I'm prepared to see mine throughout, but I'm uncomfortable about the God thing, that there's something over, over and above this. I mean, whether molecules have some something akin to mind, I don't know. But at least I don't think, even if they do, that means God. I don't think that they come together in Robert Kuhn, who, you know, apparently never feels guilt. But anyhow, <laughs> what, I, what I do think is I don't think, and I'm obviously with Thomas Nagel here, I don't need to bring God in, which I think a panentheist like Whitehead is doing. Of course, Whitehead's God is is a is is a, a let's say an unconventional God. Sure. And I mean, I at some level, if I were going to be a believer, I'd be very, I'd be at least take Whitehead very seriously. Right. I think he he really does grapple with the yeah. problem. I like a go I like a God that can learn. I, I yeah, I, no, yeah. I, I you know co-creator or something like that. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm very empathetic to that, but I don't think you need it. <laughs> okay, let's go on to another uh, race. You make the uh, the point that other people do as well that uh, a genetic analysis will show that 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 race is a uh, is a concept that really shouldn't exist. Well, first of all, the main thing I want to say is we don't have different subspecies. It's pretty right. clear. I mean, I'm not you know I'm I'm using other people's findings that you have different subspecies of, of chimpanzee, for instance, and I think it's clear that Homo sapiens did have different subspecies. Uh, Neanderthals and Denisovians. So, I mean, that, I'm not against that. But what we know is that humans went through a pretty tight bottleneck. You know, what they talk about 15K individuals altogether. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get the variation. Of course, people like Lewinton pointed this out. Quite, I mean, everybody points this. The, the, you know, the amount of variation you've got is certainly less than 10%. So biologically, there's no cause for talk about race. Obviously, humans are different. Some of us are darker than others. But we know why that is because of, you know, quick individual. I mean, some of us are lactose tolerant and some are lactose intolerant. Pretty clear that this is not more than 10,000 years ago, but it makes a hell of a lot of difference if you're faced with a, you know, a, a, a nice milky cup of Ovaltine, whether you can <laughs> drink it or not. So OK, let's go on. Um, uh, intelligence. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I, I mean, it, uh, I mean, I don't think the notion of race is a logically impossible one. I just don't think it's true. 
intelligence. Uh, you talk about pre-existing models in the mind, uh, Kantian mm -hmm. categories, uh, Pierce, Charles Pierce, mm -hmm. uh, habits, his term, which you like, um, Chomsky's deep linguistic structure and universal grammar. Uh, what does your mechanistic model say about, about uh, aspects of, of the mind that, that have these, uh, these chunks, as it were? Yeah, well, of course, you talk about intelligence. Don't forget, I'm starting with the fact that philosophers are more intelligent than anybody. As I say at the beginning of the book, <laughs> that's, that's, why, I'm, that's why I'm talking to you. I'm not talking <laughs> to anybody else. <laughs> Seriously. No, all I want to say, and it's very, I mean, it's Kantian, it's, it's Peirce, it's James. I want to say, clearly, we structure our experiences. We think, I mean, Hume pointed this out. We think in terms of cause and effect. Uh, we think, I mean, if I come in and I see somebody dead on the floor, you know, I'm, I'm watching one of my police procedurals, like, you know, line of duty, <laughs> if we see, I expect it didn't just happen. And we can infer uh, who did it. It was, you know, it was somebody, you know, who did it and that sort of thing. Now, the way we think is not just something we've made up. I think it's, it's part of experience. I don't think, like Kant thought, it was categories, necessary categories for even having conceptual thought or, or uh, rational thought. I think I'm with the, with the pragmatists that in fact, uh, Darwin himself, I think that these are things which showed them that worked in the, in the struggle for existence, that somebody who came and saw a bear, two bears go in and one came out and says, oh, let's get out of the rain is not going to survive and reproduce. Somebody who sees two bears go in and one come out and says, let's move on. I'm not that, I'm not that cold and hungry. It's probably, it's probably your great, great granddad. <laughs> let's deal with morality because morality, I think is a, uh, a litmus test of the organicist versus the mechanist. Um, how can you, or can you in any way as a mechanist have morality as an absolute instead of a relative value? Yes, well, first of all, let's just backtrack a, a little bit, Robert. And this was one of the reasons why this book was so important to me. I, I make it very clear in the book that I was raised as a Quaker. It's been a long time since I believed in God, but I'm still so aware that my thinking has been so influenced by those Quakers of my childhood. And I say that proudly. Mm. So, I mean, and again, I, I don't want to seem prissy, but I want to say, yes, moral questions over and above all are the philosophical questions that I won't say worry me, but that, that are fundamental for me. And I've, I've wrestled with this. I don't think that you can get, I, I think that somebody, uh, organicist, is going to say, like Herbert Spencer, for instance, they're going to say, this is the way evolution's gone. It's led to humans. So we ought to, as it were, encourage the very forces which led to humans, they led to progress. And so what we ought to do is, I mean, Ed Wilson says this, we ought to do things to help humans. So for instance, we ought to preserve the rainforests. I mean, you know, Ed's not into eugenics, but he wants to say humans are superior. They're threatened by pollution, by global warming. Therefore, morally, we ought to do this. So I, I respect that, but uh, as I say, I don't see values out there in that sort of way. So as I say, I, I see values within, but then where do I go from here? I say, well, we've evolved in a certain way. It's made us what we are. Uh, I think that we, we know that because of what we are doing, what natural gives us a sense of well-being. I don't just mean happiness, you know, like having a few beers with your mates. I've got no objection to that. But I mean, the kind of, you know, sense of well-being. And you know what I mean. It's like when you've done one of your programs and sometimes you say, geez, I thought that was going to work, but, you know, it never came off. And then another time you're going to go and you're going to say, gosh, I didn't really expect that. But boy, I'm <laughs> proud of that. I read, I know now why I'm doing it. Now, I don't think there's anything hard. I mean, that's it. I mean, I don't think there's anything more than that. I think if you're looking for more, you're out of luck. I mean, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in, in I, but I think that that's, but I don't think that's a bad thing because it's not going around exterminating Jews. It's not going around raping little children. It's, it's going around, when do you feel good? When do you feel good? When you've been able, a kid's been lost, you see them in the park and sure. you, you know, you look after them and mum comes up and you say, is this your kid? And she says, oh, thank you so much. I was so worried. You know, you walk away feeling okay. 
And so, that, I don't think there's any higher than that. No, I, I, I agree. I, I agree. I think there's a consistency to say that moral relativism is consistent with a mechanistic view. And then you can add all the beautiful human aspects, which you do and you do marvelously. But I just want to make that that clear because some people think that you can embed an absolute morality in a mechanistic worldview. Of course they do. Of course they do. I mean, I think they're wrong. I mean, I mean of course, the point is, I want to say, I don't think that they're mechanists. I think if you asked Ed Wilson, he would swear blind that he's a mechanist. He would say, I don't want anything to do with the long veto and that sort of thing. But ultimately, I don't think the guy is a mechanist. You go into his lab or the lab he used to have. He had a picture of Darwin on the wall. He had a much bigger picture of Herbert Spencer. And I, I remember saying to him, Ed, what's this? Great man, Mike, great man. Mark you, I will say the biggest picture was of Ed Wilson getting the Medal of Science from Jimmy Carter. That was, <laughs> that was the biggest one on the wall. <laughs> so my position is this. People who call themselves mechanists and think that they're getting it out of the world are just plain wrong. I mean, I don't mean, I mean, I think they're wrong, whether they, whether they realize they're deceiving themselves. So I don't want to be condescending about, well, I do. Uh, but I do want to say, I think that they're, they can't do it. it you know, it's square in the circle, can't be done. That mm. if you're a mechanist, then you there's no values in it. And what you've got to do then is if you believe in values, as I do, then where do they come from? They come from within. Mm. Of course, and what it's not arbitrary, it comes from within the kind of nature I've got. Mm. And I've evolved as a social being. I'm not a lion or a tiger. My you know, my relatives, your relatives, were hunter-gatherers, and the way that they succeeded was not by being bigger and stronger, was by getting on with each other, working with each other. And so that's my nature. And there is no, there's nothing higher than that. If you say, oh yes, but that's not good enough. Uh, all I can say is <laughs> Too bad. that's the very point the existentialists are making. Mm. There is, there's nothing beyond this friend. This, you know, what does Camus say? Life is absurd. Of course it's not absurd, but it, we know what he means. What he means is if you're looking for some ultimate ontological, theological, whatever right. it is. Right. Not only are you out of luck, you're looking for you know, the black hat which never was there. How about this quote? Morality is an illusion put in place by our genes to make us good cooperators and therefore uh, a better Boy, fit. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty good statement. I wonder, did you get that out of the Oxford Dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, obviously what Ed and I were saying at that point was by illusion, we mean metaethics is an illusion. What we mean is that if you do something good and you say, oh no, I did it not because I thought it was good, because God said it was good and God expects me to obey him, or because it's like the platonic forms, it exists uh, mm -hmm. independently right. of us. I say that's an illusion, that's an illusion, but that's, that's metaethics. I'm not talking about what we what we philosophers call substantive ethics, like love little, you know, be kind to little children, and you know, don't beat little old ladies on the head on Fridays. That's substantive ethics. I don't think that's illusory. Look, my last question uh, has to do with it's sort of a side issue, but uh, there have been two uh, forces or two intellectual ideas in the world that that are uh, that seek to degrade what we perceive as reality. And one, and you're familiar, I know the, for the, with the first for sure, uh, Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism, which he, um, he embeds sort of a self-contradictory, if, if we evolved uh, to escape tigers on the, on the savannah, uh, there's no necess it's not necessary that that conform to some absolute uh, a sense of what of realism is. So in, in that naturalistic view without God, you have embedded a quasi contradiction. Second, uh, more recently, uh, Donald Hoffman, a, 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 a scientist, a brain scientist, a cognitive scientist who uh, we've had on our chats, uh, has an evolutionary argument against reality in which to be very, uh, to, to, uh, to summarize very briefly is that 
evolution can hide the truth because what we see is a user interface and we really don't know what's the, the machine code uh, beyond that. Um, so the, these two kind of are, are philosophical arguments based on different motivations, but they, uh, they, they really seek to invade your territory. And so- Well, first of all, can I say that Alvin Plantinga's argument is not original with him. You've heard of the Valpour Declaration, you know, the thing that said that Jews can have their own homeland that, that was put out in 1917. Valpour was prime minister around at the beginning of the century. He was also a philosopher. And that yeah. argument is right there in Balfour. He says, yeah. if, if evolution is true, then it's all, as it were, working whatever the best solution is. And the best solution is not necessarily the true solution. So as it were, it doubles back on itself. And my argument to that is yes. So ultimately, at some point, I'm a coherence theorist rather than a correspondence theorist. Because I don't, I mean, I think Kant was wrong to argue for a ding a a thing in itself. I think, is that idealism? Well, it's not like Barclay's idealism, where it's all in the mind and basically it's all a reflection of God's mind and what we're watching is a kind of picture show. No, yeah. but I, I do think that the, and again, because this ties in with what I've been saying about paradigms and metaphors, everything that we do is this interaction. I don't think that there's a solid datum given to us out there in that sort of way. Yeah. No. You know, who was it? Um, Harry Putnam said, of course, that doesn't mean to say it, we can still make a distinction between illusion and reality. If, if you and I, if you've had a few drinks and next morning you see rats running up the wall, that's probably illusory, Bob. But, you know, Robert, that's probably illusory. So we can distinguish between that and, oh, my God, I've got a terrible headache. So we can make these distinctions. But if you ask me ultimately, are we looking at, you know, what does Locke call it, substance in general, what Kant calls the thing in itself, the ding a -zik. You know, I, I'm with people, the, the idea of people like Schelling, who said, you know, that's not, it's not doing any work, it's not terribly helpful. So, mm. yes, at some level, I'm, as I say, I'm a coherence theorist. Now, of course, Plantinga is not, because Plantinga is not only a Christian, he's a Calvinist Christian. And so he believes, he says this in, what is it, Census Divinatus. So he believes that God gives him sort of Skyping ability. I mean, this is a bit snarky, but it's not meant that way. It gives, God gives us kind of Skyping you know, abilities to peer into ultimate reality. But he's got God behind, but he starts with God, you see. Sure. Uh, sure. And the point is, I don't. So yes, I think it's a perfect, but it doesn't mean, I mean, then Plantinga, you see, then goes on to over egg the pudding. He says things like, well, we could, you know, we could be having this discussion with Richard Dawkins uh, at high table and talking about these things when we're really fighting crocodiles. You know, BS. <laughs> no, that's not how natural selection works. It, of course, I'm pre quite prepared to say it makes us, I mean, there's a, maybe there's a very good reason why when you meet a girl or boy, you, you know, how you fall in love and how you fantasize about how perfect they are. <laughs> of course, a year or two later, when dirty diapers have got to be changed, you realize that wasn't quite, but okay. But it, I'm quite prepared to say that evolution fills us. Why does it do that? Because if we went into every relationship like a philosopher, as it were, we, <laughs> none of us would ever get married. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I think you've got to take, if, if you want to say people are being deceived, and I'm prepared to say that I've certainly been deceived in a lot of my early relationships, <laughs> then I want a reason why. And saying that Richard Dawkins could be thinking he's arguing at the high table when he's really fighting crocodiles, I want a reason why. And then there isn't <laughs> one, you know, there isn't one. So this is the trouble with, with philosophers, is they start with an idea and they think that making up one of these imaginary pictures, uh, philosophers today, analytic philosophers, are terrific at this sort of, remember, think you're in the laboratory and you're sitting down there and suddenly you hear a sound from outside and you see a green Volkswagen being, you know, come on. Okay, the, the, the trolley problem, the trolley problem. Oh my God, the, I mean, 
Nobody has ever been on a, a thing with a fat bloke next to them looking at a trolley going down. It, you know, but oh my God, the number of people have got tenure on that one. So, <laughs> I want to say, yeah, it's fun, but at some level, it's not really grown up. Michael, uh, A Philosopher Looks at Human Beings is a terrific book. I recommend it to everyone. I enjoyed it myself. Uh, a very thoughtful, very probative, a very honest book. Uh, and uh, people will look for areas of agreement and disagreement, which is, which is terrific. Uh, it's great seeing you again. I look forward to uh, working together on a philosophy. Well, I, 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 I want to uh, end with this reflection. I think it was a friend of David, David Hume who said he tried doing philosophy, but humor kept breaking in. I want to <laughs> say, you know, being a philosopher doesn't mean that you've just swallowed a lemon. Being a philosopher <laughs> can be a huge amount of fun. I, I wouldn't have done it for 60 years if, you know, if it was just tedious, if it was just tedious scheming and God knows taking calculus exams. <laughs> philosophy, yeah, it's meaningful. And well, we're going we're to be doing fun. this. We're going to be doing this for another 60 years, you and I. So uh, great, <laughs> great, great to see you and more to come. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.